Good morning again, and thank you, Molly, for the nice introduction and for inviting me to join this important panel today. It's a pleasure to talk with everyone this morning. Most of my presentation today will focus on my upcoming book, Half American. But before I get it, before I get there, I wanted to call your attention to a great online resource created by the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. History Unfolded is an online project that asks students, teachers, and history buffs throughout the United States what was possible for Americans to have known about the Holocaust as it was happening and how Americans responded. Uh, many of you might already know about the History Unfolded project, but for those of you who don't, I want to take a few minutes to share it with you. Participants look in local newspapers for news and opinion from about 44 different Holocaust era events that took place in the United States and Europe and submit articles they found to a national database. So far, more than 43,000 articles have been submitted. And so if you were to Google History Unfolded, it would take you to this website and you can search through this tremendous database of all these different uh, newspaper articles that different um, students, teachers, and then history buffs have uploaded to the site. It's a tremendous teaching resource, um, both at the college level, uh, junior high and high school level as well, to be able to share these primary sources with students. Of the 43,000 articles that have been uploaded, uh, a couple hundred have been uploaded by my students, and those are focusing on the Black press. Um, what was interesting about how Black newspapers covered these events in the 1930s, 1940s, was the early attention they paid to what was going on in Germany and the rest of Europe. They were particularly attentive to the kind of discrimination and attacks that Jewish people faced, um, in part because they understood that what African Americans were encountering in the United States was not uniquely an American phenomenon. They understood and, and could sympathize with the kind of uh, racism and discrimination and violence that Jewish people were encountering in Germany and across Europe. This article, for example, is from the Chicago Defender, a leading Black newspaper from November 1938. It describes NAACP leader Walter White speaking out against the anti-Jewish pogrom known as Kristallnacht. He calls it an example of what happens when a government tears democracy up by the roots. Um, and there are dozens and dozens of primary source examples like this that you could find in the History Unfolded website. The other thing that was prevalent in the Black press was that the United States was being hypocritical when it was criticizing the Nazi regime in Germany, but not expressing the same concerns about democracy and freedom for African Americans at home. Um, this is an editorial cartoon from the Pittsburgh Courier from 1938 as well, um, where you can see Uncle Sam standing at the door, um, gesturing towards welcoming white allies from the rest of Europe who are fleeing from Hitler's regime, while at the same time endorsing or not doing anything about disenfranchisement and ostracism and discrimination of African Americans and other people of color in the United States. So I share these as just two examples of the really bountiful range of primary source evidence you could find on the History Unfolded website. I want to take just a couple minutes to start there. So I start with History Unfolded because I think it's a great example of how much we still have to learn about the history of the Holocaust. And the recent rise in anti-Semitism in our country makes it clear how important it is to understand this history. I felt a similar sense of urgency as I've worked on this book for the past six years. My presentation today is from my upcoming book called Half American. It aims to tell the definitive history of Black Americans in World War II. It'll be published this September by Viking Books, and I'm excited to give you a sneak peek of some of the research. Let me start by taking us back 80 years. Shortly after the attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941, James Thompson, a 26-year-old from Wichita, could not sleep. He registered with the Selective Service the prior year, and now, with the US declaring war on Japan and Germany, it was only a matter of time before he was drafted. The prospect of war was frightening for many civilians, but something else was on his mind on that cold Kansas night. Sitting in his family's home in a vibrant black neighborhood amidst a segregated American city, Thompson wrote a letter expressing the concerns that he and many other black Americans felt about joining a racially segregated military. Should I sacrifice my life to live half American? Thompson asked. Will things be better in the next generation to follow? Would it be demanding too much to demand full citizenship rights in exchange for sacrificing my life? Is the kind of America I know worth defending? Printed in the Pittsburgh Courier, an influential Black newspaper, Thompson's letter launched the African American Double Victory Campaign during World War II to secure victory over fascism abroad and victory over racism at home. I have not been able to shake these words from my head as I've worked on this book for the past several years. Should I sacrifice my life to live half American? These words are as relevant today as they were some eight decades ago. 
My goal in writing this book is to enable Americans to reckon with the real history of the war and its present day consequences. As a historian, I'm troubled by the connect collective amnesia in US politics and media around racism. It permeates daily interactions in communities across the country. This ignorance has consequences. When Americans celebrate the country's victory in World War II, but forget that the US armed forces were segregated, that the Red Cross segregated blood donors, that Black World War II veterans returned to the country only to be denied jobs and housing, or that Black vets were attacked or murdered for violating the color line, it becomes all the more difficult to talk honestly about racism in the present. During our time together today, I'd like to focus on the roles Black troops played at Pearl Harbor and D-Day, as well as how Black veterans helped lead the civil rights movement after the war. The story begins on one of the most pivotal days in American history. Shortly before 8 a.m. on December 7th, 1941, mess attendant second class Doris Miller was in the galley of the USS West Virginia gathering dirty laundry when he heard the low drone of dozens of planes flying over Pearl Harbor's battleship row. Miller, a black messman from Waco, Texas, was about to distinguish himself as a hero during the attack that drew the United States into World War II. He heard a bugle call for a fire and rescue crew and several explosions, distant but getting closer. Initially, he thought it was a drill, but then he remembered it was Sunday morning, an unusual time for so much commotion. As Miller struggled to comprehend what was happening, a torpedo struck the West Virginia, dislodging the rudder and sending a giant geyser of water over the ship's stack and crashing down on the deck. Minutes later, more torpedoes pounded the West Virginia, knocking out the electricity and causing the ship to list rapidly to port. As the general alarm, alarm sounded, Miller rushed to his battle station in the middle of the ship. When he arrived, he saw that his station had been destroyed by the barrage. Amidst the explosions and anti-aircraft fire, Miller heard officers calling for all available men to go topside. A former high school football player and shipboard boxing champion, the 22-year-old Miller was strong and athletic, but he had trouble navigating his six foot three inch, 200 pound frame through the dark smoke filled corridors of the tilting and flooding ship. Torpedoes and bombs continued to rock the ship, tossing those below deck into hard metal walls and flinging men above deck into the flaming oil choked harbor water. When Miller finally made it topside, the morning's chaos came into clearer view. The planes bore the Empire of Japan's red ball symbol. From the deck of the West Virginia, he could see flames and giant plumes of smoke coming from the nearby USS Arizona and USS Oklahoma. The West Virginia had been stationed at Pearl Harbor for months to guard against a potential attack, and Miller knew black messmen on the other ships. On shore leave, the messmen would swap stories about ports they'd visited in the Caribbean and South America, and about the indignities, large and small, of cooking and cleaning for white officers. They wondered when the United States would officially enter the war. Now, with smoke blotting out the sun over Oahu, they had their answer. Miller had little time to process the horrible realities of war unfolding before him. On the upper deck, the lieutenant commander spotted Miller and enlisted the powerful Texan to help him carry the ship's commander, whose abdomen had been sliced open by a piece of metal from a bomb explosion. Using a makeshift stretcher, Miller helped move his mortally wounded captain to a sheltered spot below the navigation bridge. A lieutenant then ordered Miller to quickly follow him to a pair of unmanned 50 caliber anti-aircraft machine guns. Despite having no training on the ship's weapons, Miller loaded ammunition and fired at the Japanese planes that continued to buzz overhead. It wasn't hard, Miller later recalled. I just pulled the trigger and she worked fine. I had watched the others fire these guns. I guess I fired her for about 15 minutes. I think I got one of those Japanese planes. They were diving pretty close to us, he said. Their ammunition spent, Miller and his lieutenant used a fire hose to beat back the flames on the deck and pulled several sailors out of the burning water. With the West Virginia sinking into the harbor, Miller and his surviving shipmates climbed hand over hand down a rope suspended from a boat crane and into the water. They swam nearly a quarter mile to shore, dodging patches of flaming oil as the bodies of their fallen countrymen floated in the water. Japanese planes continued to menace the sky. What would be several weeks before Miller's name was released to the public, word quickly spread that a black messman had performed heroically at Pearl Harbor. This story resonated with African-Americans because over the prior decade, military leaders had gone out of their way to disparage black servicemen. The army argued that black people lacked the intelligence, courage, and skill to serve in combat and relegated black troops to service roles. 
At the start of the war, the Marine Corps did not allow any black men to serve. In the Navy, policies dictated that black Americans could only be drafted or volunteer for the Messman branch, where they would serve and feed white officers. And all of the military was racially segregated. This policy of segregation was costly and inefficient because it required the construction and maintenance of separate and redundant training facilities, as well as the additional logistical planning for troop transportation and deployments. Segregation made no sense for a military that was about to fight a global war on an unprecedented scale. For Black Americans, Doris Miller's heroism at Pearl Harbor was a rebuke of the military's policy of segregation. Miller showed that Black men could perform bravely in combat if only given the opportunity. Enemy, enemy torpedoes made no distinction between white sailors and Black messmen, they argued. So why should the Navy? This anger flowed through the pages of the Black press after Pearl Harbor. The front page of the Chicago Defender after the attack read, Awake, White America, the hour is at hand. The editors wrote, White America must learn now that a Negro in the armed service of his country and the uniform of his government must be respected as a defender of democracy. He cannot be insulted in this uniform that now represents a sacred cause. He must not be spat upon, jailed, beaten, cursed, and otherwise abused and tormented as has been the case, then called upon to sacrifice his life for those who hold his patrioti patriotism so cheaply. Before striking back against Japan, the newspaper called for Americans to first bomb the color line. The Defender's front page also profiled three young Chicagoans who heeded the radio appeals from army recruiters to remember Pearl Harbor and attempted to volunteer for military service. 21-year-old Edgar Davis, 19-year-old Louis Grady, and 20-year-old Mitchell Jordan stood in line with hundreds of other men, but were turned away by the recruiting officer because the army did not have enough all black units to accommodate them. Don't you accept American citizens in this army? Davis asked. Just imagine what that would feel like to volunteer to serve your country after the attack on Pearl Harbor, only to be turned away because of the color of your skin. It was humiliating and infuriating. In the editorial page of the crisis, Roy Wilkins argued that 13 million black Americans were fighting for a, world, a new world, which will not only contain not a Hitler, but not Hitlerism a world in which lynching, brutality, terror, humiliation, and degradation through segregation and discrimination shall have no place either here or there. Reflecting his frustration over the War Department meeting, Wilkins charged that the fight against Hitlerism must begin in Washington, DC, and must attack the military system of racial segregation. A lily white Navy cannot fight for a free world, he argued. A Jim Crow army cannot fight for a free world. It was not enough to fight for freedom and democracy on foreign battlefields if freedom and democracy remained out of reach for Black Americans at home. Doris Miller was not the only Black American at Pearl Harbor, and the sacrifices these Black messmen made during the attack were nowhere more evident than in the communities that mourned them. In Birmingham, Alabama, more than 300 people filled the pews at 16th Street Baptist Church for memorial service to honor Julius Ellsbury, a 20-year-old mess attendant first class on the USS Oklahoma. Ellsbury volunteered for the Navy as soon as he turned 18, and on the morning of December 7th, he helped several shipmates reach safety before he was killed. As his parents and six younger siblings sat in the church's front row, his mother thought of how Julius had written her just before the attack to apologize for missing Christmas for the second year in a row. He enclosed a money order to buy presents for his family. The next letter she received was an official telegram from the Navy saying that her son was lost in action in the line of duty and in the service of his country. She was devastated to lose her son. Nothing could bring Julius back, but she took pride in seeing his Navy picture displayed prominently in homes and businesses throughout Black Birmingham with the message, remember Pearl Harbor. The local newspaper editor compared Ellsbury to Crispus Attucks, the Black hero who was the first American killed in the American Revolution. No man, not even an admiral, can give more to his country than his life, the editor wrote. Even as Black Americans joined their fellow citizens in preparing for war abroad, they continued to fight racism and violence at home. Just two months after Pearl Harbor, a 26-year-old mill worker named Cleo Wright was br brutally lynched in Sykeston, Missouri. The, the killing sent shockwaves throughout the country. Civil rights activists called for a federal investigation and dozens of ordinary black citizens also wrote to President Roosevelt, including a black, a Brooklyn father who asked, is this the democracy we're trying to teach the world? 
a Black Army draftee encourages fellow soldiers to remember Cleo as we die for democracy. The New York Times suggested that the lynching gave comfort to the Nazis, while the Cleveland Column Post wrote that the Missouri mob proved to America and the world that they could out Hitler Hitler in brutal savagery. Several newspapers stressed that the lynching had international implications, noting that Germany and Japan used Sykeson as anti-American propaganda. In Missouri, local civil rights activists organized a mass rally in St. Louis. Over 3,500 people filled the YMCA gymnasium and listened to speakers call for federal anti-lynching legislation. Protesters carried signs reading, remember Pearl Harbor, remember Sykeston too. This slogan caught on and was repeated at protest meetings and in black newspapers across the country over the next several months. Just weeks after Pearl Harbor, the stakes of World War II were clear for black Americans. Defeating the Axis powers was an important national priority for which thousands of black people would risk their lives. But defeating fascism on foreign battlefields was only half the fight. Victory would be incomplete unless it also uprooted racism in America. These dual war aims coalesced under a slogan that came to define the Black American experience during the war, double victory. If Pearl Harbor is one of the defining moments of World War II, another is D-Day. Here again, the story looks very different from the African-American perspective. By the time the sun rose over the English Channel on D-Day, June 6, 1944, most of the men in the 582nd Engineer Dump Truck Company were already seasick. Saltwater sprayed their faces as the ship bobbed and swayed in the chop. Overhead, B-17 Flying Fortresses, B-24 Liberators, and B-26 Marauders raced toward the shore. The engineers heard and felt the Allied bombs and battleships pounding Hitler's Atlantic Wall of trenches, pillboxes, and bunkers that fortified the French coast. Each blast felt like a concussive punch. Looking to either side of their transport ship, the engineers saw hundreds of vessels, many with large silver anti-aircraft balloons floating above them. The balloons were tethered to the ships and manned by the 320th Barrage Balloon Battalion, a black unit whose men were assigned to protect more than 150 vessels during the channel crossing. The engineers learned about the 320th earlier in the year when both units were stationed in England. Amidst the drone of airplane engines and thump of explosions, Seeing those silver balloons lifted the engineer's spirits. It was a clear sign that other black troops were in the largest amata ever assembled. When the 382nd landed at Utah Beach mid-morning on D-Day, they immediately set to work. Their job was to destroy the steel and log obstacles the Nazis installed along the beach, carry ashore and install bridge equipment, and haul away landmines. Nazi bullets did not discriminate, and black engineers faced heavy machine gun fire as they prepared the landing zone. The engineers enabled thousands of infantry troops to safely reach the beach and then pushed up the steep coast to open an exit for Allied troops to move inland. Other Black units landed at, at Normandy on D-Day as well, including the 385th Quartermaster Companies and Port Battalions, about 1,700 Black troops in all. That these troops were not classified as combat soldiers made no difference to enemy machine gunners or snipers. Amphibious truck drivers called ducks faced enemy fire while bringing troops and supplies ashore. Hollywood filmmaker John Ford was on the beach on D-Day directing a Coast Guard camera crew. He marveled at the bravery of black troops. He said, I remember watching one of those black truck drivers in a duck loaded with supplies. He dropped them on the beach, unloaded, went back for more. Shells landed around him. The Germans were really after him. He avoided every obstacle and just kept going back and forth, back and forth, completely calm. I thought, by God, if anyone deserves a medal, that man does. Ford considered leaving the relatively safe, his relatively safe place to get a photograph of the soldier, but thought better of it. The hell with it, Ford thought. I was willing to admit he was braver than I was. Landing in different zones on both Omaha and Utah beaches, members of the 320th Balloon Battalion searched for each other amidst the chaos of battle. After nightfall, they worked in groups of three and four to launch a dozen of their hydrogen-filled balloons over the beaches. The balloons hovered at low altitudes, making it more challenging for German planes to strafe the coast or accurately drop their bombs. Enemy planes that dared fly low risked hitting the thin steel cables armed with explosives that dangled from the balloons. These floating mines formed a silver curtain of defense along the coast. 
Waverly Woodson Jr., a pre-med student at, Link at Philadelphia's Lincoln University and medic with the 320th, performed heroic land eating. En route to Omaha Beach, his landing craft hit a mine and was torn apart by a Nazi shell. The man next to him was blown up and Woodson feared that his own shrapnel wounds would kill him. Another medic bandaged Woodson's gashes as the ship, as the ship drifted ashore. Woodson waded through chest high water and scrambled for shelter on the beach. Woodson set up a medical aid station and over the next 30 hours, he tended to more than 200 wounded men. He patched wounds, removed bullets and dispensed blood plasma. He amputated a soldier's foot and saved three men from drowning. Black newspapers hailed Woodson as the number one invasion hero and the military newspaper Stars and Stripes said Woodson and his fellow medics <clears throat> covered themselves with glory on D-Day. The army awarded Woodson and four other black medics the Bronze Star, the service's fourth highest award. Woodson's commanding officer recommended that he receive the Distinguished Service Cross and U.S. General John Lee felt that Woodson deserved the Medal of Honor, the Army's highest honor. These recommendations were ignored. None of the 433 Medals of Honor awarded during the war were bestowed on Black troops. Landing thousands of troops on D-Day was an amazing feat, but it was only the first part of the battle. Reinforcing and supplying these soldiers as they pushed across the countryside and hedgerows was the second and larger phase. By the end of June, the Allies landed 850,000 troops and 150,000 vehicles at Normandy. D-Day simply stood for day of the invasion. Thousands of troops landed on the French coast on D-Day plus one, D-Day plus two, and for weeks thereafter. All of these men required food, ammunition, and replacement parts for airplanes, tanks, and trucks. Black troops were even more important in this phase because they were the backbone of the Army's service and supply units. As American combat forces pushed in Nazi-occupied France, France, they could only go as far as the supply lines could take them, which meant they could only go as far as black supply troops could take them. Black troops were everywhere after D-Day. General service engineers removed thousands of mines and repaired railroad tracks. Duck drivers zipped back and forth across the channel, ferrying materials from port to coast, then carrying supplies inland. The 320th manned their silver curtain of barrage balloons, preventing Nazi planes from dropping to strafing altitude. They were joined by black anti-aircraft gunners on a hilltop above the beaches who watched the skies for enemy planes. After helping secure Utah Beach, the 582nd used their dump trucks to carry troops 50 miles west to the important port of Cherbourg and evacuate wounded soldiers and prisoners, dodging mines and machine gun fire on the roads. The engineers carried members of the 82nd Airborne Division to the front, and the paratroopers dubbed the truck drivers the paradumpers. Just mile, miles behind the front, quartermasters baked bread and transported it every day using mobile mixers, ovens, and toasters. Black service troops always also buried many of the nearly 23,000 Americans who died in and around Normandy. Burying the dead was important for both morale and sanitation. It was backbreaking and emotionally devastating work. Neat rows of crosses belied the gruesome tasks of battlefield cleanup and burying fellow soldiers. One grave registration troop said, not many of us were killed, but we died in different ways. Although the D-Day contributions of black troops would be obscured over time, contemporary journalists praised their efforts. Visiting France in August, New York Times war correspondent, um, Raymond Daniel, compared witnessing the work of black service and supply troops to going backstage in the theater. He wrote, I got a glimpse of the scene shifters, stagehands and electricians who contributed their unseen parts of the drama unfolding before the eyes of those in front of the footlight. Here were the men in the machinery behind the lines whose toil and sweat had made possible the victorious lightning thrust of our armies toward Paris and the Seine. You could say black troops during, the, during World War II were the essential workers of their day. By October, Allied troops led by General George Patton, General Bernard Montgomery, and Lieutenant General Omer Bradley had advanced more than 400 miles, liberating Paris and Brussels and entering Western Germany. Time Magazine said it was the miracle of supply that put the Nazis on their heels. Ali Stewart, a black war correspondent wrote, although port battalions and work troops are not generally regarded on par with frontline combat troops, it is a matter of record that no group of soldiers in this theater 
has done more to make possible Allied victory. They liberate, liberate no towns, see no flags, drink no champagne, nor kiss happy girls. Yet when things become critical, the first cry of high command is, give us more supplies. The heart of the Allies supply effort in Western Europe was a truck convoy driven mostly by black quartermaster troops called the Red Ball Express. The name, the name came from a railway tradition where railmen marked priority cars with a red dot. As three dozen divisions fought their way across France and Belgium, the Allies had to move more than 20,000 20, tons of supplies every day from the invasion beaches in Cherbourg Port to the front. General Bradley later said, logistics, this was the dullest subject in the world, but logistics were the lifeblood of the Allied armies in France. Without the black truck drivers and the supplies they delivered, Allied forces could not move, shoot, or eat. With most of the French railway system in ruins, the Allies turned to a fleet of thousands of six by six, two and a half ton General Motors cargo trucks, nicknamed the Jimmy or Deuce and a Half. These trucks and the black men who drove them made the US Army the most mobile and mechanized force in the war and gave the Allies a dis decided strategic advantage over the German infantry divisions, which were overly reliant on rail, wagon trains, and horses to move troops and supplies. From August through November 1944, 23,000 American truck drivers and cargo loaders, 70% of whom were black, moved more than 400,000 tons of ammunition, gasoline, medical supplies, and rations to battlefronts in France, Belgium, and Germany. A typical German division during the same period had nearly 10 times as many horses as motor vehicles. This limited the range of the vaunted Blitzkrieg or lightning attacks because German tank and motorized units could not move far ahead of their infantry divisions and supplies. In contrast, when the Allies reached the Seine River nearly two weeks earlier than expected, the truck convoy allowed the Allies to chase the retreating German armies without outrunning their supply lines. General Patton concluded that the two and a half ton truck is our most, truck is our most valuable weapon. Colonel John D. Eisenhower, the Supreme Commander's son, argued that without the Red Ball truck drivers, the advances across France would not have been made. Back across the channel, the ports in and around London continued to hum with war activity. In the six months after D-Day, the port of Southampton was the busiest in the world. More than 6,400 vessels left Southampton bound for France, carrying nearly 2 million military personnel, 170,000 vehicles, and more than 1.7 million tons of supplies. Black troops made up more than 90% of the port companies at Southampton, more than half of the truck companies, and almost all of its quartermaster and engineer general service regiments. Almost everything the Allies transported to the front passed through the hands of at least one Black American. The Allies' push toward Germany would have sputtered to a halt without these Black port troops working around the clock. And it wasn't just men. Major Charity Adams led the 688th Central Postal Directory Battalion, who made sure troops in the European theater received mail from home. Black American nurses had already served in Australia, Africa, and England, but with more than 800 members, this postal battalion was by far the largest unit of Black women to serve overseas during the war. Working in unheated warehouses with windows blacked out to prevent light showing during nighttime air raids, the women worked in shifts around the clock. Adopting the motto, no mail, will morale, they process an average of 65,000 pieces of mail per shift and develop systems to get letters to their intended recipients. This was no simple task with units moving constantly and thousands of soldiers having common names like Robert Smith. Having spent the last six years researching this book, I can say definitively that Black Americans played a vital role in helping the Allies win the war. In Europe, victory brought a flood of different emotions for Black troops. Guarding German prisoners of war gave Black soldiers the particular gratification of refuting myths of Aryan superiority. The 761st Black Panthers Tank, tank Battalion participated in the liberation of Gunschurkin uh, subcamp of the Malthusian concentration camp in Austria. And other Black troops witnessed evidence of Nazi atrocities and documented the mass murder and inhuman brutality that they saw. One Chicago private told the Chicago Defender, <clears throat> excuse me, quote, the crematory was a large room filled with immense furnaces that were used by the German SS troops 24 hours a day to burn dying inmates. The place had a horrible odor of burned human flesh. 
The troops that captured the camp put out the flames that were burning the bodies, and we could see the remains of those that had not been completely destroyed. If black soldiers harbored any doubts about why the Third Reich needed to be destroyed, these uncertainties vanished when the horror of the Holocaust became clear. And these reports also make clear the horrors of the Holocaust to black readers at home who are following the, the story closely. One of the black soldiers who witnessed the camps was Leon Bass, whose picture is here. He said, just looking at these people who were skin and bone and dressed in those pajama type uniforms, their heads clean shaved and filled with sores due to, due, to, due to malnutrition. And here they were coming towards us, making all kinds of guttural statements using their own language. It was difficult for me to comprehend what was going on. I just looked at it in amazement. And I said to myself, you know, my God, who are these people? What have they done? What was their crime? You know, it's hard for me to understand why anybody could have been treated this way. I don't care what they had done. And I didn't have any way of thinking or putting a handle on it, no frame of reference. I was only 20 years old. Bass was 20 years old when he witnessed the concentration camp, and he didn't speak about what he saw for another 20 years. What was troubling for Bass is that he went from seeing the atrocities of the Nazis in Germany to experiencing racism in the United States, and he wasn't alone. When black veterans came home at the end of the war, they returned to a country that disrespected their service and was openly hostile to them in their communities. On June 29, 1945, for example, Mississippi Senator James O. Eastland rose to spoke on the floor of the Senate. He described black soldiers as dismal failures in combat and said that they have disgraced the flag of their country. Eastland and his ilk understood that black Americans greeted victory abroad by redoubling their fight for civil rights at home and that black veterans were important leaders in this battle for freedom and equality. For Americans committed to upholding Jim Crow segregation, Black veterans and their military service were extremely dangerous. That day on the floor of the Senate, Eastland described African Americans as an inferior race before concluding, I'm proud that I have the purest form of white blood flowing in my veins. I know that the white race is the superior race. It has ruled the world. It has given us civilization. It is responsible for all the progress on earth. If these words are upsetting today, and they should be, Imagine how they sounded to Black veterans who risked their lives and saw their buddies killed fighting for freedom and democracy abroad. This is where we can see the biggest difference in what World War II meant for Black Americans. While America achieved a military victory over Germany and Japan in 1945, that was not the end of the war for Black Americans. An equally important battle against racism continued on the home front. After four years of brutal war, Returning to the way things used to be was obviously appealing to millions of white citizens, but it was, a, it was the exact opposite of what Black Americans were demanding. For Black Americans, returning to normal meant going back to a system of legalized racial apartheid in the South, where racial hierarchies were enforced through lynching and voter disenfranchisement. It meant riding in the back of the bus, stepping off the sidewalk to let a white person pass, and being denied access to lunch counters and swimming pools all in order to remind you that you were a second-class citizen. In all regions of the country, returning to normal for Black Americans meant being harassed and beaten by police, not being able to get a mortgage to live in most neighborhoods, attending segregated and under-resourced schools, and being the last hired and first fired in the workplace. The last thing Black people wanted was a return to a country that treated them as half American. They saw the war as part of a much larger struggle to take democracy off of parchment and give it life. That's what the double victory campaign was about, making America a democracy for everyone. Black veterans swelled the ranks of civil rights organizations and became key players in black freedom struggles across the country. I reference just a few names here. Reverend Josiah Williams, who earned a Purple Heart in France serving as an infantryman under George General Patton, was beaten almost to death when he tried to drink from a white only fountain in Savannah, Georgia, after the war. He worked alongside Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference to lead Black voter registration drives in the South. Women, women's Army Corps veteran W. Johnson Roundtree used the GI Bill to attend Howard University Law School. She established a law firm in Washington, D.C., and in the landmark civil rights case, Sarah Keyes versus Carolina Coach Company, 1955, helped secure a ban on racial segregation and in interstate bus travel. Veteran Oliver Brown protested school segregation in Topeka, Kansas. 
His daughter, Linda Brown, was one of the students at the center of the historic Brown versus Board of Education decision. Medgar Evers loaded cargo for the black truck drivers on the Red Ball Express, who transported supplies across France after D-Day. After earning two bronze stars on the beachhead of Normandy and in Northern France, Evers celebrated his 21st birthday in 1946 by leading a group of black veterans who attempted to register to vote in Decatur, Mississippi, only to be turned away by a white mob with guns. He said, I had been on Omaha Beach. All we black soldiers wanted was to be ordinary citizens. We fought during the war for America, Mississippi included. Now, after the Germans and Japanese hadn't killed us, it looked as though the white Mississippians would. Evers continued to fight for civil rights until he was assassinated in 1963. He was buried with full military honors at Arlington National Cemetery. Let me conclude by reiterating that the stories of World War II that do not reckon with the Black American experience leave us ill-prepared ill to understand the present and rudderless as we try to navigate the future. Ignorance is a luxury we cannot afford. If we tell the right stories about the war, we can meet the resurgence of explicit racism as a deeply entrenched aspect of our country's political history and cultural life, rather than a surprise or anomaly. If we tell the right stories about the war, we can see the modern battles over voting rights and racial justice as the continuation of a decades long struggle to make America an actual functioning democracy. And if we tell the right stories about the war, we can finally honor the sacrifices of black veterans, defense industry workers and citizens who fought on foreign battlefields and in their own cities and towns so that no one would ever again be treated as half American. Thank you and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Um, so many of our participants today uh, teach middle and high school students. So how could teachers incorporate this history into, into their teaching? What do you, do you have some recommendations? Yeah, um, maybe, let me try, it's a great question. Let me try to think of it in kind of three ways. One, I think the kind of big picture stories we tell about the war, um, I think that's why it's in the kind of panel that's going on today and thinking about the history of the Holocaust is really, really important. The story we tell generally about the war um, is wrong in a lot of ways, that if you actually look at what Americans understood about the war at the time, um, for a lot of Americans in 1942, 1943, people were really unclear about why the United States was involved in this war. So retroactively, once it's clear what happens with the Holocaust, America starts to tell a story that the United States needed to get in to, to defeat the Nazis in order to help end the Holocaust and, and save um, the Jewish prisoners in these concentration camps. I think as you well know, that that's not the reality, right? And part of what is powerful about the History Unfolded Project is they show, despite a lot of news circulating about the Holocaust, that didn't motivate the United States to go to war. And that wasn't the motivating factor for the United States military to, to fight the war. And I think it's important at every level we're teaching to be honest about what actually Americans understood about the war and what the motivations were. And I think um, if we can be honest about how the Holocaust fits in that story, I think we can all, also be honest that it was incredibly important for the military, for the U.S. military to defeat the Nazi regime, um, but at the same time, that military was segregated and it intentionally um, supported Jim Crow segregation uh, in the United States when, when it came back. And so at a big picture level, I would like us to try to find ways of um, maintaining that actual kind of complexity and nuance in the stories we tell about the war. So it's not just sort of the simplistic good war and that the United States um, clearly understood what was happening at every moment in time. I think the other way it would be easy to weave it in would be to take the, the, the key iconic moments that show up in our, our textbooks and try to weave in additional stories. And that's why I tried to focus on Pearl Harbor and D-Day. I think particularly D-Day is that I think when you actually look at like who was part of that war effort on D-Day, it's impossible, it should be impossible to tell that story without the contributions of black troops. Um, it just depends on how, how we tell the story, which um, vantage point we're viewing it from. Um, I think in part, we tell the D-Day story based on sort of all the years of, of movies and TV shows we've seen where it's about the troops storming the beaches and that initial wave on actual D-Day. Uh, if we can broaden it out just a little bit and understand that D-Day was day of invasion. And so it still is several more months after that, that the, the battle is going on and that we have troops coming across the channel. If you can tell the story from that perspective, it makes it a lot easier to weave in the story of, of black troops who 
played a really important role in the war effort. And I think that um, it takes nothing away from the troops who were in the, the front lines who came on the beach, but it helps us understand well, how did those troops get the ammunition they needed to keep moving inland? And like, how did they keep supplied? And that helps us understand the role of black troops. And the last thing I would say is find points of continuity between the war and the civil rights era. Um, I, I think hopefully most of our junior high and high school classrooms were talking about the civil rights era as well. We shouldn't go from 1945 and then all of a sudden pick up the civil rights era in 55 or 63, right? That there's direct continuities. Um, and you can, again, do those continuities through very specific people. Um, Rosa Parks works as a seamstress um, on an army installation uh, during the war. And somewhat strangely, the, in the camp that she's at, the buses on camp are integrated, but off camp, they're not integrated. So she has a great story about riding integrated buses to the edge of camp and then having to get off and then sit in the back of a segregated bus. Um, Jean Thea Harris's biography of, of Rosa Parks is really good on that topic. Um, I think Medgar Evers' story is a, a tremendous through line. So I think picking any of these individuals and sort of tracing their history of how they go from 45 to 63 to 68, um, because I think that's what the reality on the ground for Black Americans was 50, 45 wasn't a complete victory. It was victory over the Nazis and over Japan militarily, but it certainly wasn't a victory over racism and white supremacy. And so they just came home and, and kept fighting. Thank you so much. Well, um, I'm getting so many great comments thanking you for being here and for such a fascinating presentation. So thank you for your time.